Good morning. I'm Pastor Mike from Park Avenue Baptist Church, and I'm so glad you've chosen to join us today. We at Park Ave want to be a help to you, so if you have a prayer request or a question about today's sermon, fill out the Connect card in the comments section below. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks for being with us, and we hope you enjoy today's service. Good morning, Park Avenue Baptist Church. Thank you so much for being with us today. We are in week five of our six-week series, Benefits Included. What should my church family expect from me? And we are looking at some of the one another commands that God has given us as part of the New Testament uh, that help to point us to the ways that we as church members are to interact with one another. Uh, we know this is true, that we all like benefits. We all like being part of something where uh, some of the benefits slope toward us. Um, God created the church with a specific purpose, that is to be a, a beacon in a hurting and broken world of the hope that he offers. And a healthy church is a community where we gain benefits, but we also get to be a benefit to others. And that's just some of the uh, mysterious design of the church that on paper, it doesn't seem like it should work out the way that it does. But when we follow God and are obedient to him, uh, some things happen that we can't necessarily explain. Uh, we've talked about four of those one another commands so far. Love one another, encourage one another, stop condemning each other, and confess to one another. I'm not going to review all of those. Last week, as we looked in the book of James and the command to confess to one another, we came across a couple of key ideas. First being that faith-fueled prayer fits every occasion in the life of the Christ follower. Uh, it doesn't matter uh, what we are up against, whether it is a positive event or a negative event, prayer is appropriate, and that prayer is fueled by our faith. It is in recognition of our complete dependence on him, our great need, and his great supply. And then we also talked about these ideas, that your position as a justified saint was secured at the point of salvation. You don't confess so that you will be saved. Um, you don't confess so that God will love you. Uh, you receive his gift of salvation. And from that point on, your connection with God is maintained by regular confession. Um, some of us get into a bad habit of thinking that, well, I confessed my sin once to God and he saved me and now I don't need to deal with that anymore. It's all under the blood. And that's not a biblical approach. Yes, at the point of salvation, your sin is cared for, but part of your ongoing growth and communion with God is continued confession. Uh, confession positions us to maximize spiritual growth, but deception and isolation will always hinder our spiritual growth. So confession is an aspect of spiritual growth. It's a, it's a way of tending the soil in which we grow spiritually. Uh, confession is not the sum and total of spiritual growth, but without confession, we are greatly hindered in those efforts. Well, today we wanna to move ahead to our fifth one another statement. And this comes out of a familiar passage for many of us. We've touched on this recently. Uh, as part of our series on boundaries, uh, Galatians chapter 6. And verse 2 there uh, brings us right to our statement, and then we want to go back and build some context around that. It says, carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. So our uh, one another command number five is carry each other's burdens. Uh, I want to back up, I want to read down through this passage, these first five verses of Galatians chapter 6. We're going to pause along the way and make some observations as we go. Um, so let me start out by reading those first two verses for us together, and then we will make some observations. 
Uh, brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Now, some observations for us. First of all, he addresses them as brothers and sisters. That's brothers and sisters in Christ. It indicates the familial bonds uh, that unite us. We are not just the part of an organization together by being part of a local church. We are part of a family together. Uh, something far more enduring. Uh, next, it says, if someone is caught in a sin, I want to clarify there because uh, we could read that a couple of different ways. The original language would indicate that that idea of caught in sin means someone who is dealing with sin, not I discovered you in a sin you are trying to hide. It's not the idea of uh, being caught with your hand in the cookie jar. It's the idea of being ensnared and being in need of assistance. So it is much more a, an idea of, I need help from you, I'm in trouble, than it is, well, you need help from us and we're coming, whether you, whether you want us or not. It is very much the idea of someone there who is saying, help me. Uh, next, uh, the unstuck help the stuck. Uh, and we all get stuck sometimes. It's important for us to understand that we will not always be the rescuer. Sometimes we will be the one who needs to be rescued. And as the passage unfolds, we're going to notice some language that helps us to understand uh, the, the attitude with which we are to come, it should be a humble attitude, a compassionate attitude, a gentle attitude. Because when we're struggling, when we're in trouble, that's the way we want to be treated. And so it is a good idea for us to start with that approach when somebody else is struggling. Uh, next it says, you who live by the Spirit. Uh, this is a tricky one for us because very often we can read that as well, live by the Spirit is not the same as being rigorously religious. Uh, that person does not need someone who uh, is in church every Sunday, dressed perfectly, drops a fat check in the offering plate. That's not who they need coming after them to help. I mean, it, that person may have those characteristics, but they need someone who has the heart of God that is touched with compassion, that is aware of their own frailty, and is allowing God to work through them, not saying, well, it's up to me to go after them and get them back on the straight and narrow. Uh, we can behave in very religious ways and be very dis disconnected from the heart of God. I think we need to be careful. We're not winning them back to church. We're not winning them back to religion or not winning them back to what will people think if you keep acting that way. We are winning them back to the heart of God. We want them in fellowship with him and there may be um, there may be some spiritual triage that needs to happen there and we don't want to just slap a, a good public relations sticker over the face of a deep wound and say oh now you're good. So I think it's an area for us to be very careful. Um, living by the Spirit is marked by a consistent connection with God, not by impressive perfection. Uh, living by the Spirit isn't going, well, I have it all together. It's actually acknowledging, wow, I do not have it all together, and I need a Savior to continually be active in my life and in my heart at work in me. The reality, and we're going to return to this a little later on, is that pride kills compassion. It just squashes it. And when I think too highly of myself, I become increasingly unwilling to lower myself to get into the mess that you're in to help you. And so pride and deception, as we talked about last week, are really enemy one 
in this situation. Uh, continuing in verse 1, uh, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. The language there is very specific and I think very important. Uh, the verb that is used there, you should restore. And how should you restore? You should restore them gently. And um, we read restore them gently, but often we do something entirely different. We judge them quietly. Or we rebuke them harshly. Or we ignore them resolutely. And sometimes we gossip about them prayerfully. And none of those are what our God calls us to do. We are to restore them gently. Um, our goal is to be gentle and compassionate with them with the goal of restoration. We want them to be brought back in close to God, not driven further away. And often our actions, our attitudes, our words accomplish the exact opposite of what we've been called to do. And then there's a warning here, but watch yourselves or you also may be tempted. And I think we need to be careful that we don't go, well then I'm not getting anywhere near those simple people because it sounds like it's contagious. Um, they're dealing with temptation and if I get too close, I'm gonna get contaminated with temptation as well. And I think that's a, that's a, that's a twisted way and an inaccurate way uh, to think about this. Uh, this doesn't mean that I will necessarily be tempted with the same sin they're struggling with. Uh, because the sin I struggle with may be entirely different. Uh, but when I seek to restore, I come humbly and cautiously, not like a skilled lifeguard, but like a fellow swimmer, equally prone to drowning. Uh, I come and I extend to them, forgive me the lifeguard analogy here, but I come extending to them the the life buoy of God's word, of God's spirit, and of loving Christian community, not swimming out there going, I'll rescue them, uh, because I am just as prone to drowning as they are. I need to be careful, I need to be humble, and like most rescue efforts whenever possible, that's a, that's a group activity, that's not something you pursue solo unless you absolutely have to because it's good to have backup. A rescue scenario is often one with unpredictable elements and you could wrongly assess and say, oh, I think I can handle this. I don't need anybody else and get in there and now there are two people who need to be rescued. So I think we need to be very, very careful here. Um, continuing on to verse two, our main verse uh, says, carry each other's burdens, and in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. Part of God's desire for us, part of his design for his church, is that we would carry each other's burdens. Uh, when we do that, we are accomplishing the purpose for which he put this amazing thing called the church into motion is that we would be able to help accomplish this. Um, a community where we receive help with the things that are too heavy for us to carry on our own, that's what the church is designed to be. Um, that is powerful. There are a lot of places in our world where there are relationships or organizations that seek to accomplish that. And many of them are good, things, but they're all a pale imitation of what the church was designed to be. God had a really good idea, a very necessary idea, and a lot of people have tried to imitate that, and um, they say that imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, so that's a good thing, but no other organization has been equipped in the same way by God to accomplish this. And then also here, kind of a sobering reminder for us, where there are no helpers, there is no help. If we as a church become a people 
who are too self-absorbed, too busy with our programs and our activities to make space to help someone when they are burdened. Um, not only are we missing part of our purpose as a church, but when you are the one who is stuck, there's not going to be anyone to help you either. Um, if we are not available to help others, we have no right to expect that someone will be present to help us. And we don't know when that need may come, what the magnitude of that need will be, but when that comes, it's too late to try to build an infrastructure that can support that weight that already has to be in place. And so when we show up and are available to help one another, when we sacrifice and helping typically involves some sort of sacrifice, it's going to be, well, I had something else I wanted to do. I would have used that time differently left to myself. But it's that kind of sacrificial love uh, that, that comes around and is reciprocated in powerful ways at the times when we most need it. Um, the next set of verses, um, oh, before we go there, I wanted to introduce this statement. This is not original with me, and I don't think it was original in where I heard it. So I don't know original source, but I just really liked this. Uh, if that is too heavy for you, then I will help carry it too. Uh, I'd like to read that one more time. Would you, wherever you are watching, would you just say that with me? If that is too heavy for you, then I will help carry it too. That's part of the mission of the church. That is how we are to respond to one another in the body of Christ. Uh, next verse, verse 3. If anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. That beautifully ties into what we talked about last week. Just the power of deception to make us think, um, well, <coughs> in this case, uh, I don't think I need any help. Well, that's deception. Uh, I don't really think I can be bothered to help someone else. Well, that's deception. Uh, and it's all dangerous for us. Uh, verse 4, we continue. Each one should test their own actions. Then they, then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else. For each one should carry their own load. Now, there's some things there in verse 4. That then they can take pride in themselves alone. Uh, and we're like, well, pride's a bad thing. Well, it can be a bad thing. The way in which it's being used here. Uh, not really. Uh, we test, why did I do what I did? And is that a good thing? And we weigh that up against ourselves, not against anybody else, because someone else has been resourced differently. They may have different time constraints or lack thereof. They may have different skills that they can bring to bear. Um, if, if your car breaks down and you call me, um, I, I, I will pray for you. I can probably help you get a ride somewhere, but you don't want me coming to help fix your car. Um, and I could compare myself against somebody else that has skills in that area and be like, oh, I'm just no good because I can't do what they can do. And that is unfair and it is dangerous because it allows Satan opportunity to diminish me and may immobilize me from doing what I very well can do. There may be somebody else that you can get to help you with your car, and in the meantime, I can help get you where you need to be, but if I get so discouraged that I'm not the fixer, that I refuse to be the helper either one, uh, there's a danger there. Uh, Pride kills compassion. Uh, Warren Wiersbe expressed it this way. Uh, he said, the legalist is not interested in bearing burdens. Instead, he adds to the burdens of others. It's a good reminder for us that, that what, what do I do? 
Do I help bear people's burdens or do I add to their burdens? Um, the Pharisees were very much part of this in the New Testament culture. Uh, when Jesus arrived on the scene and started his ministry, uh, they were adding burdens. They weren't helping to remove them. Uh, when we shut down compassion for those who are hurting, we make room for comparisons. We make room for judgments, for greed, for laziness, and a host of other poisons. Uh, when we refuse to develop a heart of compassion like Christ modeled for us, uh, something will fill that space. And most often it's going to be some of these other negatives that are there for us. Um, we've talked about this before. There's an apparent contradiction in this passage that's really pretty easy to resolve. But if you, we don't have the right tools to do so, it, it, it seems like wait, Paul just said two different things. In verse 2, he says, carry each other's burdens. And then in verse 5, he says, for each one should carry their own load. And we're like, well, which is it? Well, it's both, because just like in English, those are two different words, burdens and load. Uh, in the original languages, they were as well. And so that word there for loads, almost we can think of like a backpack. Um, it's filled with typical daily responsibilities such that a normally resourced person can handle them on their own. So verse five, for each one should carry their own load is saying yeah, for each one should carry their own backpack. Uh, and then burdens is a completely different kind of word and we can think of burdens more like we would like boulders. Uh, burdens are boulders that land in our lives uninvited and unexpected and they are more than we can handle on our own. Um, a backpack, typically, we can go, oh, it's a little uncomfortable. The straps are, are rubbing at my shoulders a little bit, and I, I'm looking forward to being able to put this down, but I can handle this. Uh, boulders come into our lives, and, and we didn't see it coming, and all of a sudden we're dealing with something, and it's, it's overwhelming. It's more than we can handle, and we need help. Uh, now... My caution here for us would be, again, in the area of deception, we think that we can readily assess, well, that's a load and that's a burden. So I'll help here, I'm not gonna help here. And uh, I would suggest to you that there are variations in backpacks. Um, you may look at my backpack and go, oh, that looks just like my backpack. It looks just as full as my backpack. He should be able to carry that. He doesn't need my help. Uh, however, our backpacks may look the same, but if we were to compare, we might find out that, wow, his backpack has a whole bunch of really heavy things in it that are, wow, that feels very different than my backpack, even though it looks very similar. Uh, and I think we need to be careful. We also need to keep in mind that not all backpacks are equal and not all carriers of backpacks have the same capacities. So there may be something that's been worn down by their backpack and we go, well, that's their job to carry that on their own and they may need a break. You can't carry their backpack for them forever but if they've been dealing with some exceptional burdens, even their backpack may be overwhelming for them for a time. And if we can help, we should help. Uh, I think it's just a good reminder for us that what someone views as a boulder in their life, for somebody else, that, that might be like, I have one of those in my backpack. It's not a problem. Well, it's not a problem for you because God may have resourced you differently. Uh, so we just need to be careful. We, I think we need to be open and compassionate. Um, I want to close with some application for us and then bring it back to the cross. Always a good idea for us. So uh, what can I do in relation to all of this? Well, I have five things for you that I want to talk about very quickly. First of all, uh, train to handle your load responsibly. 
Um, get used to carrying your backpack. Um, do that as responsibly as you can, as consistently as you can. Drawing on strength from community, strength from God. Um, participate well in your spiritual disciplines so that you can handle your load responsibly and so perhaps you will have some strength left over to lend to somebody else's burden. Um, if you're always operating at your max capacity and you can't get rid of your backpack, then when a need comes up, you're gonna say, mm, sorry, I got nothing to give. And uh, there may be seasons like that, but it shouldn't be the pattern of life for us. Uh, second and third, I put these two on the same slide because they tie right in together. Uh, secondly, ask God to give you a heart of compassion and eyes to see burdens you can help bear. Uh, neither of those things, a heart of compassion or eyes to see burdens, neither of those come to us naturally. It is a very good thing for us to be having ongoing conversation with God about that. Um, in part because when we ask God, God, give me more of a heart of compassion. When he brings things into our lives to help develop that, we're going to be quicker to recognize it and say, Oh, God, I see what you're doing here. Uh, and third, choose a compassionate reaction first. Uh, you may hear about a need that someone has, and your first thought may be, well, if they just handled their finances more responsibly, they wouldn't be in this spot. Uh, if they worked harder ahead, they wouldn't be in this spot. If they had just done things the way I would have done things, they wouldn't be in this spot. And we can easily come with an attitude of, well, if people were just more like me, this world would be such a better place. And... I would suggest to you that that's probably the height of arrogance right there. So we need to choose a compassionate reaction first. Assume the best until we know the worst, and then you may need to assume the best some more. Um, it's very human of us to come up with a long list of reasons why I shouldn't help, because they shouldn't have this burden in their life, and they did this to themselves. And I suspect that for most of us, that's not the way we prefer to be treated in those moments. So it's a wonderful opportunity for us to, again, treat others the way we would like to be treated. Uh, number four, don't try to be a hero. Uh, God is not waiting to give up a trophy to you for rushing in single-handedly and uh, handling this burden in their life and for you to be able to go, look what I did. Um, the body functions the best when the body functions together. And so what I, I would encourage you, if you see an area where there is a need, rather than going, well, I can take care of that. Um, we can be people of extremes who either go, well, somebody should do something about that and we do nothing or we say, I can handle that, and we do everything, potentially puff ourselves up with pride and potentially exhaust ourselves so that we're not ready to help everybody else. We're, we're so depleted. And so whenever possible, make bearing someone's burden a team activity. Get a couple of people that can help you with that, that you guys work at it together. Uh, that's more of a blessing to the person that you're helping and it's less of a drain on your resources. And then lastly, and this kind of ties in there with four, uh, whenever possible, wear a mask. Uh, I don't necessarily mean that literally, but what I do mean is um, if you can help me to need anonymously, consider doing it. And if you're like, well, I don't want to do it anonymously. I want them to know who helped. Why? Why is that so important to you that they know who helped or that someone notices? Um, are you doing what you're doing to help them? 
or are you doing what you're doing to have people think well of you? And God sees what you are doing, so it has been noticed by the person who matters most, and um, he has a wonderful way of helping to keep our pride in check. Uh, when other people are ready to throw us a parade, he can say, thanks, that was great. Um, how much have I done for you? How do I demonstrate love to you? And you see me attaching a lot of strings there. And so I think it can be a good idea for us to, when possible, uh, keep our ego out of this and do it out of love for this person and for our God, not out of what we will gain. Before we close, I just want to share a couple of verses out of Isaiah 53. Because again, God does not ask us to do something that he has not done himself and that the person, Jesus Christ, has not modeled for us. And so I think the gospel is a beautiful picture of this very principle. Because I was carrying everything I could possibly carry. But my sin was so burdensome and so overwhelming that I needed a savior. I needed a rescuer. I was incapable of handling that burden on my own. And God sent a rescuer. He sent a savior. And so, if we're going to say, I want to be more like Jesus, well, in this very area of helping to bear others' burdens is wonderful place where that can become evident in our lives. Let me just read these three verses from Isaiah 53. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him and by his wounds we are healed we all like sheep have gone astray each of us has turned to our own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all I hope today affords us an opportunity to reflect Ooh. and to say Father God, thank you. Thank you for helping to bear the burden that I could not bear on my own. As we close, I just want to bring us back around to this statement. If that's too heavy for you, then I will help carry it too. It's a good reminder for us of the service we have been called to as we seek to be more like Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your goodness. Uh, God, I thank you for your example. That you, Before you asked us to do this, you modeled it perfectly. You showed, it, showed us what it looks like uh, in its ultimate form. Uh, and God, we're not up to doing that, and it's a good thing because you have not called us to do that. But God, you have called us to do the part we can do. And so, God, I pray that you be with us today as we reflect and as we invite you to challenge us. Um, God, a life that is involved in giving beyond ourselves is a more fulfilling life. We thank you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for being with us this morning. Have a great week.